I'd like to welcome everyone to today's Public Health Practice Grand Rounds for February 2012. My name is Molly Mitchell, and I'm the coordinator for the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center. And on behalf of the Training Center and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, I'd like to welcome everybody to our Grand Rounds for today on the HPV vaccine public health and ethics analysis. Before we get started with today's presentation, I'd like to just make a few announcements for those of you who are watching online. I'd like you to please take a minute to go ahead and sign in. That'll give us a better count for the numbers of, uh, to let our federal funders know how many people are watching today. Um, also, if you have any questions at all during today's presentation, please just click on the link on your screen and you can send us an emailed questions for either of our presenters. Um, and I'd like to also, again, for those online and for you in the live audience, um, to draw your attention to some of our public health practice uh, trainings that are coming up. And they include practical grant writing, community assessment informative evaluation, and logic models. And also, feel free to look at some of our trainings that are available on our website, which include a lot of our archived public health practice grand rounds. So with that, I think I'll go ahead and introduce today's speakers. Uh, we have Drs. Nancy Cass and Connie Trimble. Nancy Cass is a Phoebe R. Berman Professor of Bioethics and Public Health in the Department of Health Policy and Management with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Public Health and Deputy Director for Public Health in the Berman Institute of Bioethics. Dr. Cass conducts empirical work in bioethics and health policy. Her publications are primarily in the field of U.S. and international research ethics HIV AIDS ethics policy, public health ethics, and ethics of public health preparedness. Dr. Cass co-chaired the National Cancer Institute Committee to develop recommendations for informed consent documents for cancer clinical trials and served on the NCI's central IRB. Dr. Cass is the director of the PhD program in bioethics and health policy at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and is the director of the Fogarty Johns Hopkins Bioethics Training Program for African Scientists. Dr. Cass is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine and a fellow of the Hastings Center. Dr. Connie Trimble is double boarded in obstetrics gynecology and in anatomic pathology with specialty training in gynecological pathology. Her clinical and translational research focuses on mechanisms of immune cell homing and function in the genital tract and the development of immune therapies for disease caused by human papillomavirus, HPV. She is an NIH-funded investigator and holds three INDs governing the conduct of investigator-initiated clinical trials testing immune therapies for HPV-16 positive cervical dysplasia. She is the director of the hospital-based program for screening for cervical cancer and the director of the House Staff Research Program in the Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics at Johns Hopkins Hospital. In her free time, she likes to sing, to work out, and to play golf without keeping score. I'll hand the floor over to Dr. Nancy Cass. Uh, thank you, Molly, very much, and it's really nice to be here. Um, let me give everyone a bit of an outline about how we've decided to organize the next hour. Um, I'm going to start with some slides that introduce um, this concept of public health ethics. What is public health ethics, and how do we go about thinking through an ethics question in the context of a public health program or a new public health initiative, like, for example, um, rolling out HPV vaccine. Um, Dr. Trimble will then give a lot of background on HPV, HPV vaccine, so that we better understand the context we're talking about. And then I'll come back with just a couple of slides thinking through specifically a few of the ethics questions um, and policy questions about HPV vaccine, like whether it should be mandatory and what about boys and all that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to start uh, at the at the bird's eye view. And I'm going to start by talking about public health, and then I'm going to talk about ethics, and then I'm going to bring them together. So the Institute of Medicine did its first report on public health in 1988 and defined public health as what we, as a society, do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. And I think this definition is really rich because it talks about um, some really foundational values of public health, like it's something we do together. 
And it's something we do to set the conditions so that people theoretically can choose to make healthy choices. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I want to highlight um, some important sentinel events in the history of public health because, again, I think it does highlight the way in which public health goes about doing its work, um, which is still very true today. So one of the early pieces on my timeline is that in 1701 in Massachusetts, um, smallpox isolation was put into place and ship quarantine laws were put into place. So the point is public health came in and limited people's rights for the sake of protecting the public's health. In the 1800s, Edwin Chadwick in England discovered that there was more than a two-fold difference between the health outcomes, the life expectancy between rich people and poor people due to social conditions. Unfortunately, something that hasn't changed, but again becomes really relevant to what people in public health have to think about. Um, first, vital statistics saying, okay, what part of what public health does is collect data whether or not people want it, collects data in order to get important outcomes, track uh, trends in the public's health. Um, again, this idea of social conditions being relevant, people mapped garbage heaps and housing conditions to disease outbreaks and found there was a very strong um, correlation. And then in this country, a little more than 100 years ago, every state, one by one, created state uh, boards of health. Um, that among other things were empowered through laws that they passed to enforce sanitary regulations and, and other uh, laws. Public health has many tools at its disposal. I've talked about data collection, which comes in many forms, surveillance, vital statistics, registries. Public health also um, becomes proactive in doing outreach and education, basically making sure people know what are good habits, things like the food pyramid that became the food plate, um, the billboards you see, all of those kinds of things are a way that public health does outreach to let people know. Um, they also do outreach in ways that uh, maybe you would call a bit more invasive, um, contact tracing, um, epidemiologic investigations, and then there are regulations and laws. And if you will, at one end of the spectrum, Public health is authorized by every state in this country with something called the police power. And that means that, that um, states are allowed coercive action under state authority to encourage educational efforts, but also to seize property, close businesses like restaurants, destroy animals, or involuntarily treat or even lock away individuals for the name of protecting the public's health. So let me switch a little bit to bioethics. Bioethics is a relatively modern name. It's a modern term. It's about 40 years old, but it absolutely has its roots in medical ethics, which has a very, very long history. Um, Percival's Code of Medical Ethics was developed in the 1800s, but there are, people obviously talk about the Hippocratic Oath, and there are um, writings that date back literally for thousands of years talking about physicians' duties to care compassionately for their patients, to do well by their patients, and there are, um, again, these foundational documents in medical ethics that have a much longer history. The American Medical Association in this country published its first code of medical ethics just over 150 years ago. Most of the codes of medical ethics focused on the duties between one doctor and one patient. So public health comes along and health policy comes along and even in medicine there become more and more questions that are talked about at a societal level and not just at the bedside between one doctor and one patient. So for example, um, artificial kidneys are developed and even kidney transplantation leads to questions about resource allocation and there are big public debates about should scarce resources in medicine go only to the most socially valued people or the richest people or is that not fair fundamentally we don't want a society that is organized in that way well this becomes a question of ethics that doesn't quite fit in the old medical ethics model um, some of you will remember the names Karen Ann Quinlan or Nancy Cruzan, and there were debates about when to turn off the ventilator and who has the right to say, and whether there should be public policy about end-of-life care that it maybe goes beyond just the individual question, again, of a doctor and patient. There then were in the 1960s and 70s a lot of questions about research studies that were be being done in ways that people didn't 
think were ethically appropriate. Tuskegee certainly at the top of the list, but there were others as well. Um, and there were a lot of new technologies, new reproductive technologies, new genetic technologies. All of these together led to people saying, we have to think about ethical frameworks and ethical guides that go beyond the one-on-one -on -one doctor patient. So this is where people say uh, there was the birth of bioethics. At that time, however, the places from which bioethics grew led still for bioethics to have a fairly strong emphasis on, on, on autonomy. So bioethics talked about several principles that it stood for, doing good for people, respecting autonomy, and being fair. But as people started to develop individual guidelines, there was often a very strong emphasis on individual autonomy and the importance of respecting autonomy. So patients um, and research participants have the right to refuse. You can refuse that ventilator. You can refuse research particip uh, participation. Patients' rights movement, um, informed consent in medicine, and certainly in research became absolutely the norm, for particularly for things that are more consequential. And the old codes of medical ethics were a Amended. The AMA code, for example, was amended to say things like, um, not only must you do good for your patient, but if in the end the patient doesn't want that treatment, the ethically right thing for you to do as a doctor is to respect that refusal. So there was this strong emphasis on non-interference. For anybody who does public health, we know that sometimes our emphasis is not only on what do you want, have I explained it well, well if you don't want it then that's okay, I'll step back. We have a different kind of um, value that we place on a lot of pieces of public health work that are fundamentally important to being able to do this work successfully. So there's a very strong value in public health on benefit to others. This whole idea of we collectively make the conditions for everyone to be healthy is thinking uh, broadly about utility and again beneficence, this ethics principle that's quite different from autonomy. Um, and justice is fundamentally important. This work dating back to the 1800s of Edwin Chadwick of seeing that there's a difference in life expectancy between the rich and the poor or mapping garbage heaps is fundamentally a way for public health to say if we don't have socially just conditions we will never have good public health outcomes. So for people like me who care about ethics and care deeply about public health we come to these questions of so what's the right ethical frame for us? We do need ethical guides that can both give us, if you will, negative constraints, limits on what we can do, because there's actually this police power in every state of the country saying we can lock people up, we can close restaurants, we can kill animals. So there has to be some restraint so that we don't feel like we can go and impose laws on every single thing that conceivably could lead to a better public health outcome. Um, an example that I often give is um, we're going to be talking about a sexually transmitted disease today. HIV is another big one. Gonorrhea, syphilis is still a huge problem in Baltimore. But we don't have laws that say, for example, anybody who dates on a college campus is required to use a condom or they can be locked up. Okay? It would be a really effective public health intervention, but there are other values that are important to us in addition. Um, and so it's important for public health ethics to think about, well, what are the negative restraints? What are the limits, the boundaries we'll put around what public health really can do? Arguably, we would also want public health, public health ethics to um, affirm some positive obligations as well. And again, the social justice theme is so important. And presumably, ethically, public health must do certain things. Um, it must do certain uh, interventions to improve the public's health, and again, arguably, must do certain kinds of things to improve conditions under which people can thrive. I'm going to present two um, frameworks that exist for thinking about public health ethics, and again, then I'm going to stop and we're going to focus on HPV specifically. So the first comes from an article that for people interested in this, I recommend by Jim Childress and, and several other people called Mapping the Terrain. And in this article, they outline five core principles or things to pay attention to if you want to think about the ethics side of a proposed public health program. One of these is effectiveness, right? Part of what public health does a lot of times is start we don't even think of it because we do it all the time, but in certain ways trampling on people's rights, whether it's requiring vaccines or requiring calorie labeling. I mean, that seems so innocuous. I think it is pretty uh, low infringement in the scheme of things, but there always has to be some kind of attention to was it effective. 
Proportionality is another ethics theme here. It says um, the more infringement there is, the more, the larger the outcome, and arguably the more confident we have to be that this outcome really will happen. Necessity, if there will be infringement, we have to say that this is the only way we could have achieved that goal. If you can achieve the same public health benefit through lesser infringement, I would like to say, obviously, it is the ethically right decision to go with less infringement for the same, um, for the same outcome. Um, so necessity, at least infringement, go together. And then public justification. And this is what we in the ethics world call procedural justice. It's attention to process when we're thinking of the ethical good. And if there are things that we're debating um, and people don't know, there's some people in the public who think that that's too much infringement and other people think it's okay, then there needs to be an opportunity for public conversation, for public input. So I'm also going to introduce another framework. This was one that I published, um, but that uh, have very, some very similar ideas in it. This um, came up the year before the other one. I have references on both for anybody who cares. So this is um, intended to be a very practical framework for people in public health who are, again, trying to think through, should I do that program or not? Is it OK to have this kind of um, infringement? Is it OK to work with only one population and not others, et cetera? So step one is, what's the goal? And again, today we're going to be talking about HPV vaccine. So what's the goal of having an HPV vaccine program, right? And in my view, the goal of the program has to be stated in terms of reduction of morbidity and mortality. Now, it may be that the particular program, like calorie labeling, does not directly in that moment lead to less obesity in our population, but there needs to be a causal chain that people can make and pay attention to um, that will lead to something that is a reduction in morbidity and mortality. To simply say this calorie labeling or this smoking cessation program will get, for example, fewer people to smoke is not enough in and of itself. Or saying this education program will get more people to know what is healthy food is not enough if all the rest of the steps don't happen. Step two is how effective is that intervention in achieving the goal, right? So we all could point, we could all rattle off five things right away that we would like to be better in terms of public health outcomes. It might be less obesity, it might be less chronic um, heart disease, it might be less of certain infectious diseases, less injury. Um, and how do we know that this intervention actually will achieve that? It turns out in the history of both medicine and public health, there are a lot of really great ideas that turned out to be wrong. And this is the step of the analysis that says there have to be data. And if there aren't data, then you need to study it. But you can't go ahead and impose a public health program that might have an infringement without some pretty clear data saying it does make a difference. Again, particularly if there is some kind of infringement or if you're targeting one population or the other. If there are data, then good. You know what the goal is. There are data that show that that intervention really will help to achieve that goal. Then you go on to the next step which is what are the known burdens? So, okay, I'm, I've now dealt with the good side of the equation. I know what my public health goal is, and I have data that this intervention, at least to some degree, will help ameliorate that. So how burdensome is it? How burdensome is this intervention? Um, there can be, in public health intervention, risks to liberty, risks to self-determination. And I'm not going through all of this, but it's on the slides. Obviously, different public health programs raise these in different ways. It's our bread and butter. Um, nothing to be ashamed of, from my view, but something that's really important to pay attention to for every intervention we might propose. Um, there can be risks to privacy. Uh, physical risks, obviously it comes up in questions about vaccines, um, and risks to justice happen if there's some way in which my program would further exacerbate um, disparities. How can burdens be minimized? So the first step in burdens is to think through what are all the bad things that could possibly happen, particularly in the name of ethics, threats to people's welfare or interests, and then what could I do in the planning and design of my program to minimize those? 
And very often we do that in public health and maybe we don't even realize it. So even in contact tracing, there's a duty on the public health person to do the contact tracing. But the person in question with gonorrhea who might not want to give the names doesn't go to jail for not doing that. So the way the law is written is that the public health person has a duty to ask and follow up but the person who's scared about giving a name does not have consequences to them. And that's a, we, a way of ameliorating some of the burdens of contact tracing. So informing people about the burdens is a way of lessening them. Confidentiality protections, apply, applying burdens justly, um, comparing benefits and burdens of different um, alternatives. And then something that we can maybe talk about later that happens in some vaccine programs as a sort of paradigmatic example is sometimes allowing people opt-outs to what are otherwise mandatory programs. And I don't need to tell this crowd lots of pros and cons to that, but it's a way that public health navigates some of the ethics questions. Is the program implement, implemented fairly? So the first four steps are sort of what are the goals, what are the good things, what are the bad things? And then we get to is any group particularly advantaged by this? And then of course what we'll get to is, is that justifiable? Obviously with HPV vaccine, we're targeting a very particular group of um, citizens of our country if we talk about the United States. Is that fair? Well, of course there are reasons why we're targeting people in these certain age groups. Um, but you have to ask the question of if you're targeting, why is that happening? Is any group advantaged? Is any group disadvantaged? Um, fair implementation is not equal implementation. So equal implementation would be, if the program isn't the same for every single person, then we don't do it. Of course that makes no sense. Fair means it's justifiable from a public health perspective, and it's also justifiable that different groups with different needs are all getting their fair share. So it's not only that it has to be justifiable, like of course teenagers are the ones we target, but in our broad public health initiatives, we're thinking about the teenagers, we're thinking about the babies, we're thinking about the people who are older, we're thinking about the people with orphan conditions, we're thinking about the people with the highly prevalent conditions. That's another way of thinking about um, fairness. This is the justice step, this step five, and that's why I put on here also any affirmative obligation to right existing injustices. And in my view, there's this big question mark about whether public health ever ought to go beyond what I will call the, the um, narrow boundaries of public health in thinking about this question. So I'll just throw out something really provocative. Um, probably the biggest predictor for health outcomes anywhere in the world, and certainly in Baltimore, is education. So what if we took some of the public health budget and invested in public education? Probably not going to happen, but this is the kind of thing I mean that is we, if we think broadly about social conditions, it's like the garbage heaps, it's like our school being originally called um, the school of hygiene and public health. Those kinds of things ultimately can have a huge difference on public health outcomes. The last step um, is how can the benefits and burdens be balanced, and that's where the public justification um, comes in. So I um, want to stop here and turn it over to Connie, who's going to talk about HPV, and then I'll come back for a couple minutes and talk about policy options.